Hey everyone, this is Daryl Hunter. I'm one of the system engineers at Mirazon. I spent some time at the Link Conference this year, and I'm just going to share with you my experience along with my friend here, Duran. Hello, everyone. My name is Duran Bryant. I'm also a systems engineer here at Mirazon. Been in IT for about 20 years, and I've spent seven and a half of those 20 years here at Mirazon. Love working here. Had an opportunity to go to Microsoft Exchange Conference, or MEC for short, and I too will also be sharing uh, what I've learned. At Mac. Well, let's jump right in. So I'll start first. I went to the Microsoft Link conference this year. It was in Las Vegas. But before I jump into the conference, some people like to ask the question, what is Link? People sometimes aren't familiar with Microsoft's naming conventions, and I'll let you off the hook. Um, Link doesn't really mean anything. So Microsoft Link is the next generation of Microsoft's UC, Unified Communication Stack. It's actually been around for quite a while. So for some of you old timers out here like Duran, um, <laughs> Windows 98 had a product called NetMeeting. Yay, NetMeeting, long live NetMeeting. Um, NetMeeting was a tool inside Windows that allowed you to share a webcam and communicate with other people, which sounds kind of silly to be talking about in 2014, but back in the day, it was kind of a big deal. Yeah. It was a really, uh, really new to the professional market. NetMeeting, um, was great, people liked it, but it was one single application. And there was no real ecosystem around it as far as like Active Directory credentials and, and directory services and then rolling it out in a corporate environment. It was just kind of a neat toy. Microsoft in 2003 timeframe uh, built a suite called the Live Communication Server. Live Communication Server had corporate-based instant messaging. Again, that it doesn't sound interesting for 2014, um, but back in the day, Again, that was kind of new for an organization to think about corporate instant messaging as a different communication me method. LCS 2003 begat LCS 2005, which then got renamed in 2007 as Office Communication Server 2007. Because again, this is Microsoft, they like to rename things. Mm -hmm. But as they did rename things, they added a lot new, of new feature sets. They started adding in meetings. They started adding in... Um, some feature sets like cursory audio, video, schedule type things. OCS 2007 R2, the generation after that, really got good with voice and PBX integration. Um, you can start doing some work with uh, Cisco and Avaya and some others if you kind of knew voice protocol and SIP. Uh, there were some really great feature sets in OCS 2007 R2 coupled with Microsoft Live Meeting. Here about 2010, Microsoft renamed it again. They called it Link, L-Y-N-C 2010. The uh, bits dropped at the very end of 2010, and it really, really took off. Um, I I've been installing every version of this. I have experience in the enterprise with every version that you'll see on your screen. But Link 2010 got a lot of people excited, including me. Um, I remember the first customer that Mirzon installed for Link was in December of 2010. They called us six days after the bits went live in public. They're like, hey, this new thing links out. We're all excited about it. Can you come install it? And that just kind of speaks to um, the excitedness that the enterprise and the markets had for the Link product. Today, Link 2013 is the current version. Who knows what the new version v.next would look like. Um, but that's kind of how we got to Link today. What's good to know is that Link is constantly improving, um, both in feature sets Stability, interoperability, I, I know I'm kind of reading from a slide, but it's important to know that simple instant messaging and presence became audio communication, became video communication, became meetings that you could schedule through Outlook and attend via your iPhone or an Android. And now interoperability of enterprise voice with the Cisco PBX, there really is no limit to what you can do with, uh, with the right expertise and the right hardware and the right software. So one of the things that... I've talked about with lots of my customers and was really a highlight of the Link conference last year and this year uh, was robust integration with other Microsoft software. So for example, when you're sitting in Outlook and you email Duran, his picture will pop up so I can see his shining face, but also a little box will appear next to his name that will say a red, yellow, or green status to know if he's busy or available <coughs> or away from his desk. And when federating, which is you know a fancy term of connecting two link environments or link with Skype or link with another instant messaging platform that's compatible, you can share that information across enterprises and across public platforms. 
that integration inside all the different Microsoft tools, including SharePoint even for searching for skills for engineers is really amazing. And I don't want to overstate that, but I definitely don't want to understate that. It's really amazing to be able to be very collaborative um, across a product and across a product line. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing I wanted to point out is there's an OIP, that's the Open Interoperability Program. When people think of communications tools, they think of Cisco or Avaya or Shortel or Mitel or Picatel. Um, the idea uh, from traditional communication platforms is you buy hardware and software and headsets and everything from a vendor. It's probably branded, it's probably unique um, only for that product. Microsoft's gone that a different way. You can't buy a Microsoft phone. You buy a Polycom phone or a SNOM phone or an Astra phone or an HP phone or it doesn't really matter. That's why they have the Open Interoperability Program. You can find that at catalog.link.com. It really details the hardware and the software and, and the feature sets that you can add to your link environment. They've made it open and they're really relying on their partner ecosystem to make link better. I know here at Mirazon, we've deployed a wide variety of session border controllers and voice gateways and phones that not every customer wants the same thing. And that's the beauty of being able to use the OIP on link to get the customer what they want at the right feature set and the right price point. Mm -hmm. Let's jump forward a little bit. So this year was the link conference 2014. Their motto was come together. Sadly, there was no Beatles music. <laughs> um, but what was cool about link conference this year, um, it was in Las Vegas and it was at the area hotel and the area hotel, if you've not been there is really, really nice. Um, it was large this year, so I want to kind of compare and contrast a little bit from last year. Mm -hmm. Last year was the very first Link Conference. Link Conference 2013 was in San Diego, California. It was at the Hotel Dell. It was small. It was intimate. It was very, very nice, as Microsoft conferences are. Um, I forget the exact attendance. I want to think maybe 800 people, um, a small number of sessions, maybe 60 or 70. I can't Again, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was intimate. So it was neat in the link community. You kind of get to know people on Twitter. You get to know people on blogs and through TechNet. And people know each other and, and share each other and steal each other's ideas. And that's really what makes an ecosystem great. This year, the conference was large. It was double the attendees. It was, I think, three times the amount of sessions. That really speaks to how much link has grown in the enterprise and how important the product is for Microsoft. But it kind of had an interestingly different feel, where, whereas last year, you might see you know, the same people every day in the hallway. And since it was a smaller crowd, you could kind of hang out with them at a, at a fire pit at night or sitting at um, ha having a, a drink on the beach or, or whatever it might be. You had that small, intimate feel. Once you got to Las Vegas, everything's magnified. If you've been to Vegas, it's fun for a couple of days. But day three, you're kind of tired and ready to go home. <laughs> and, and a conference is no different. So even though the, there was a lot of people there and we knew each other, you kind of were scattered and spread out and you didn't have as many of those ad hoc, hey, what are you doing tonight type meetings? It was scheduled and, hey, come to this invite only party. And, and that's fine and great. And I mean, it was nice to be able to rub elbows with people in a different setting, but it was very different this year. I don't know if that's good or bad. It was just different this year. Last year at the Link Conference, there were some really exciting um, announcements. They announced Skype integration with Link, which is a really big deal. You know, once Microsoft bought Skype and started integrating it inside their product lines, Tony on stage last year uh, really talked quite a bit uh, about Skype and where it was going. And it was excitement in the air, right? They announced several new things because Link 2013 was, was new. So a lot of the new features sets of Link Room System and being able to add really great products inside the boardroom. This year, I don't want to say it was it was bad because it wasn't. It was just different. It was still Link 2013. We weren't talking about version.next. We were talking about some good additions and add-ons to the Link product line. I'm going to talk about a few of those here in a second. But that same excitement level was not there. And I don't think this is unique to Link or even when we're going to talk about Exchange. I, I think when there's not a major version release, it's hard to really build up excitement around a conference that's dedicated to that product. Because you can go to sessions and learn a lot of neat things. Um, go to the vendor floor, which is amazing. You get to meet partners and, and integrators, and you get to learn all these neat things that are out there about your product that you may not even know about. So it's really a great learning experience to spend time on the floor. But 
from stage at the keynotes and at the conference as far as announcements go, I have to admit, I was a little disappointed. You know, I saw a few things that were neat, um, bringing some new things to an Android platform or some new things to the web. And again, I'm going to talk about those. But I can't say it was ex exciting this year as it was last year. That said, the way Microsoft does their products, you know, every, what, 18 months or two years now, I anticipate next year is going to be new version. So I really am looking forward to figuring out what v.next looks like. Um, I anticipate some really great excitement. I anticipate the conference next year being uh, larger again. I mean, it was sold out in just a matter of weeks again this year. So when a conference sells out that quickly, um, you know that people are excited about the product. Darrell, I was just curious. You mentioned the, the floor, the vendor floor. What kind of vendor presence was there this year? Uh, was, it, was it dozens, hundreds? What, 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 was, what did it look like? I wouldn't say hundreds, um, definitely dozens. So I'm trying to think through what it looked like last year because I didn't spend as much time on the vendor floor last year as I would have liked to because I was having a lot more just one-on-one -on -one conversations mm -hmm. with partners and, and other technologists. Um, there were, I'm going to estimate, eight rows of vendor tables, okay. um, front and back. Um, you could definitely see the ones that were the, the, the large sponsors, right? They had the big settings out in front. and. Sure. You know, a lot of excitement and, and energy around their booths. And then there were some smaller ones around the table. But that's also where the really exciting stuff happened. Those are the guys that are scrapping. You know, they may not have the, the, the big name or the big marketing dollars, but they might have an amazing hardware product that they're wanting to make sure people know are part of the ecosystem or, or a piece of software for monitoring or analytics or in the, in the link voice world, E911, which is oftentimes neglected in a, in a voice rollout. So it was definitely a, a large number, um, larger than last year. I just can't remember the exact number. And like any other conference, right? So people have their giveaways, their t-shirts, and their bouncy balls, and all that fun <laughs> stuff. Um, but because it's so focused on link, and it's not as broad spectrum, you have a lot more just focused on link things. You, as compared to TechEd, right? We've both have been to TechEd, sure. and, and we've seen other conferences and seen other vendor floors. It's, it, it's not as wide of a breadth of products represented. Um, on the vendor floor. Okay. So at the conference, there were, uh, I've already mentioned a couple of these things. So at the conference this year, I just want to highlight four main things that were, were highlighted. Last year, they announced uh, Skype presence and Skype integration inside Link, and the world rejoiced. It was great. But it didn't have video. So it had instant messaging and presence. Um, there's some caveats. We, we have some demonstrations on our Mirazon blog for those of you that want to check it out. But it did not have video at the time. I didn't think that was really that big of a deal. Because you have IM, you have audio. When I think of Skype, I think of being able to call friends and, and relatives overseas. Video hasn't been as important to me personally because I can't get my dad to learn how to use a webcam properly sometimes, <laughs> right? So, But audio, we can click a button and it can work. But to other people, not having video was a showstopper because they want to be able to see each other's faces. They might be a remotely distributed team. So being able to look at someone in the face and, and see their expression and, and have that connection across Skype was a big deal. And I, I know that sounds silly, but it wasn't as big of a deal to me as I know it was to others. But this year when they started announcing it and everybody went crazy, I started kind of thinking through that a little bit. I think just the... The way I use products, obviously, is probably different than the large mainstream. But sure. it, was a, it was a really big hit. So Skype, Skype having link, Skype to link having video compatibility uh, was a major announcement this year. That was really exciting. Uh, Android compatibility. So Android's had a link client for a while. And link is great on an Android device. But the Android tablet did not have a good link client to be able to utilize an Android tablet. They focused on a phone. And more and more, um, you know, Dran has a tablet sitting with him today, and more and more people are using their tablets as their primary workstation. Um, one of our fellow engineers that was with me at the Link conference, Drew Haney, um, he lives and dies by his tablet. He doesn't have anything other than his tablet. Right. He's blogged quite a bit about how he rolled this tablet and how it works for him and some challenges he has. It's no different whether it's a, a Surface or an iPad or an Android. But until this year, until what's coming next, Android tablets were neglected. So they made a major announcement and a lot of demos about how they're adding more cross-platform compatibility nice. on the Android ecosystem. Yep. And I know it's a big deal for us at Mirzon. Um, many of us have iPhones, but I know Duran rocks the Android. Yep. Um, and then also, many of our customers are, are dealing with the Androids. And they're great platforms 
I can see the challenge, right? When you have so many different hardware platforms and screen sizes and versions of an operating system, it's, a, it's such an open ecosystem. Some would say fragmented, but such an open ecosystem. I can see the challenge with developing something like Link for the Android platform. Right. Right. Another one of the announcements, they call it J-Link. Um, I think, if I remember right, so I think the name of it now is the UCJA, the Unified Communications JavaScript API. There's some, been some really great blogs on this by um, a lot of the Link product team and other Link uh, partners. I know Matthew Landis uh, has talked about this quite a bit. He, he tends to get really involved and finds the right people to talk about the products. He live tweeted and live blogged the entire event. But UCJA or JLink, they're opening a new API to be able to bring rich link interaction to a website. So things like um, click here for help. Those kind of things exist already. There's some API stuff that you can do in UCMA, which is the, the um, API for link. Uh, I know Modality Systems has, is working on a product to do things like this. That's, that's great. But now imagine healthcare. Click here, talk to a doctor, see his face, be able to point to your arm that hurts and have simple conversations like that across a link environment on a web browser without adding on applications, right? right? That's just one example. They actually demoed that. Um, it's exciting. It's exciting to see where that goes. I'm, I'm not a web developer, um, so I can't get as excited about JavaScript or get excited about APIs as probably some of my friends can. Um, but I know that was a big deal, and that was a major announcement at the, uh, at the conference and the keynote. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we talked about that today. One of the last things they talked about is interesting. Um, so Gurdeep is on stage. He's, the, he's the, the lead guy. At one of the last slides in the keynote, one of the last bullet points on page was a small, what appeared to be a small footnote that said that PSTN, so public phone connectivity, is coming to Link Online. That's all it was said about it. So a lot of us were left wondering, really? What does that even mean? <laughs> because last year, at Link Conference 2013, there were a lot of announcements and fanfare about bringing Link Voice into Office 365. And they were working on this hybrid voice configuration. And, and I think if I remember right, it went live in like March. But then it died in April. And that left a lot of us wondering, what in the world is going on? Mm. So many... <clears throat> Uh, partners and, and customers started scrambling to find alternatives like Jaja or Yaya or however you pronounce it. <laughs> it, it was such a neat, neat product to have some voice capabilities in the cloud. It, even one of our other engineers that we do work with, Enrique, really liked the product. And then that product's gone as well. So many of us have kind of thought, unfortunately, that Microsoft was neglecting um, voice connectivity in the cloud. Um, when we work with customers, on Office 365 or Exchange or Link, invariably the conversation comes up with on-premise versus online and what can you do where. And Duran and I are going to talk about that here in a little bit. But seeing a, a, an announcement in a bullet point on a slide in a keynote about something amazing like voice capabilities in Link Online, you think would generate more buzz and more conversation and, I don't know, maybe a breakout session or two discussing it. But everybody was mum. And that was a little disappointing. Um, I asked some very pointed questions to some of the presenters and some product team people that, that I was able to come in contact with, names withheld to protect the innocent. Um, and no one would talk about it. So it was very tight-lipped. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means they're figuring it out or if they're ready to go and they want to you know, just blow everybody away with a kind of a surprise announcement. I don't know. Um, but I wanted to mention it because I talked to no less than 50 people at the conference about what this means, whether it was at a table at a meal or you know, out in the evening, kind of just doing whatever we're doing. People are excited to know more, and there's not more to know yet. Mm -hmm. And that's a little frustrating. Um, as, a, as a vendor, it's a frustrating as a, as a technologist. As I work with, as a solutions architect, as I work with my customers that are asking, when do I do this and how do I do this? I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. Is it version.next? Is it later this year? What does it look like? Right. But that was a Link Conference 2014 kind of in a nutshell. Let me uh, hand it over to my friend Duran. All righty. So <clears throat> Microsoft Exchange Conference, MEC 2014, was in the grand city of Austin, Texas. And uh, I got to say, you know, you, you've heard it said that everything's bigger in Texas. It, it, it really is yep. bigger in Texas. I mean, we, every meal I had, I, I left something on the table. It was just, it was just <laughs> an insane amount of food. <clears throat> the hotel we stayed in was big. It was just all big. 
thousands of people at night in May 2014 this year. So uh, it was pretty cool. Now, what I did not know is that Austin, Texas is 15 driving hours from here, right? <laughs> so I took my beautiful wife with me, and she does not like to fly. So what that meant was I was going to drive, okay? So there's a website I just found called meetmehalfway.com. And if you put in point A and point B, it tells you what's exactly in the middle. Little Rock, Arkansas hmm. is exactly in the middle between here and Austin, Texas. So that's where my wife and I stayed on the way down to Austin, Texas. So it was an interesting road trip. Listen to some cool audio books on the way down. So we get to Texas uh, and I go to the keynote. OK, and uh, the keynote was this huge thing. Thousands of people in the audience. And I have to, I have to say this because this is going to be a nice little plug for Dell. OK, not that I work for Dell, obviously, but. We're at the keynote, and towards the end of it, the product manager for Exchange 2013 gets up and she pulls out her Dell Venue Pro 8 inch tablet. Right? She says, "Let's see what's next." So she she has a second screen thing going on with these big screens behind her, and everybody's kind of salivating because she's got this nice little Dell tablet. And uh, she goes, "Oh, oh, you guys like this tablet? Well, tell you what, reach under your seat and pull out this ticket, and we'll see who won." So I, I reach under my seat, I pull out my ticket, and she starts reading the numbers. And I'm thinking, I, I never win these things, right? So she's reading the numbers. I'm going, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, I won! <laughs> so I'm screaming, I'm standing up, and I look around, and everybody else is screaming and standing up and jumping. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, they got us. It's April Fool's. I'm thinking, no, wait, this is, this is March 31st. It's not April Fool's. <laughs> yeah. So the keynote, she said, the speaker, she said, uh, yeah, no, guys, this is not an April Fool's joke. Every single person in the audience is going to get a Dell Venue Pro tablet. Wow. So I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to go home now, play with my tablet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, forget the conference, let's just go get this thing set up. And so it was kind of cool. It comes with the 64 gig microchip. Uh, it came with Office 365 free for a year. Just lots of cool things. So that's how it kicked off. That gives you, that should wow. give you an idea of the scope of this thing, right? Absolutely huge. So lots of announcements at the keynote. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about a few of those. Um, there was probably a dozen announcements, but one of the things they talked about pretty heavily was data loss prevention and exchange, DLP for short. I'll talk about that in just a bit. The future of enterprise social and how social network is going to affect the enterprise messaging environment. Uh, a thing called code name clutter. I'll tell you about that in just a bit. And also new features in OWA for and for the uninitiated, OWA is Outlook Web Access or Outlook Web App. Insert an acronym there. But it was these were the things that really caught my attention in the keynote. Lots of breakout sessions. There were probably, I want to say, 150 to 200 breakout sessions they had. Mm. Um, you know, I asked you about vendor presence on the floor. Right. The, uh, I want to say, certainly Dell probably had the biggest booth. Uh, DigiCert was there. Uh, they provide high assurance certs, SSL certs, and of course with the new heart bleed thing that's going around, the vulnerability, you know, that, that's that's something people can right. consider. You know, maybe it's time to spend more money on your cert to make sure it's right as right. opposed to some of these other vendors. Uh, but I, it wasn't it wasn't hundreds of vendors, it's kind of like what you described. Uh, but Dell had a big presence there. Digital had a big presence. Cool story. I'm sitting in one of the last breakout sessions. This is Wednesday, and I get a text message, and it says Duran. Come to the DigiCert booth. You won. I'm like, what did I win? <laughs> so I run down to the booth. I leave the I leave the session because like, I don't win stuff, right? So I leave the booth. I go to the DigiCert session, and I won this remote control helicopter. Wow, that's <laughs> right? kind of cool. Yeah. So uh, I haven't flown it yet, but they told me not to take it outside because I would lose it. They told me to keep it indoors at all times. We'll see. But let's jump in and talk about some of the things that these announcements uh, comprise of. So data loss prevention (DLP). You look at the news, what are people talking about? Security. Right. right. Target had their big data breach in uh, December of last year. The Harbley data breach is going on right now where people are uh, snagging emails. Yahoo is affected by this. So everybody's thinking about security. Right. With data loss prevention, what they've done in Exchange 2013, and this has been around for about a year, by the way, they have broken out to where you can set up rules and based on criteria to prevent emails from leaving your organization that have sensitive information. Mm. So let's say that, that John, one of our bosses, gives me the credit card number so that I can pay for Microsoft Machines, which is exactly what I did at the uh, conference. Then I'd say, you know what, I'm going to send this to myself so I can have it for later on. Well, data loss prevention would prevent me from sending that credit card number. 
outside of the organization. Yeah, that's great. So uh, a lot of companies are trying to be HIPAA compliant, PCI compliance. PCI compliance is around credit card security. Right? Uh, with HIPAA, you're trying to protect things like social security numbers from legal purposes. DLP has all of that built in. It's, it's amazing that they built all this. And so now you don't have to have this bolt-on product. You don't have to have a third-party firewall doing it. It's all built in right there since 2019. So that's, that's, that's great. If you don't mind me interrupting real yeah, quick. So I was talking to my sister recently um, about uh, something similar. Uh, not my sister. I was talking to somebody recently about something, something similar. We were talking through things like um, our, our kids and social security numbers and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I got an email with a social security number. in it. I'm like, why are you emailing your social security number? I mean, if nothing else, call me and tell me or, you know, text message me or something but an email the social security numbers in it is it's interesting you would think in 2014 people would think a little differently but it's, right. it's nice also to have a a good a good product like like exchange to keep track of that and, and other things as well but right because i always i forget things as well sure you know well yeah, and that's the thing is that sometimes people <clears throat> sending data outside of the company it's not malicious they, right they're just trying to communicate yeah and they don't realize that what they're about to do could compromise information right so with dlp you know you can set up a, a mail tip or a policy tip where as they're composing a message and it detects the credit card number you get a little pop-up hey you're about to send out sensitive information are you sure you want to do that right or you can block it on the app. right so what's nice is that they got a lot of predefined rules that are targeted to sensitive data types and you can see that on the screenshot here um so you don't have to come up with your own rules it's, it's all right there you can come up with your own rules but there's so many built in, you don't necessarily have to. Uh, it's got advanced content detection, so it's going to look for credit card numbers, social security numbers. It may even, you may have a thing that says, okay, this is what my insurance policy number looks like. If you see anything that looks like an insurance policy number, stop that from being an organization. Mm. So, very, very slick stuff. Um, built in DOP content areas, you know, depending on where you are, you care about different things. So, if you're in the US, you're going to care about HIPAA. If you're in the US, you're going to concern about PCI compliance, things like that. If you're in Germany, what you care about is going to matter. So Microsoft has built in intelligence and DLP content based on where you are. Hmm. So uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're in a different country. It's, it's right there. That's great. Yeah. Uh, it, and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I come from a company where we dealt with HIPAA quite a bit. And if I'd had this feature, it would have made my job <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier. I would have spent a lot less time there and worked with HIPAA. Right? So... Um, Enterprise, social networking. You know, everybody's on Twitter, Facebook. Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, LinkedIn. People use social networking quite a bit. The thing that Microsoft has realized is that uh, when you have to leave your inbox to go do something, that's lost productivity. So if I'm in Outlook Web App or if I'm in my Microsoft Outlook inbox and I go, okay, I would like to collaborate with Daryl. Daryl's on Twitter. How do I do that? Well, I leave that, go pull up a Twitter app, tweet deck, whatever you're you know, insert. Mm -hmm. And then I coordinate with him. Maybe I pull in some information, then I and I put it back into my inbox. So I've lost productivity doing that. Microsoft says, well, we recognize that we're making you lose productivity by having to leave your inbox to go different things. So we're gonna bring it to you. Um, Enterprise social is a new feature that they're coming up with. And this is not production yet, this is coming to your inbox soon. But it's going to enable you to participate in social conversations using the tool of your choice. So at the conference, Microsoft's social tool, of course, uh, is Yammer. Right? Have you used Yammer? I have. Um, I've used it a couple of different times. Like a few years ago, I played with it at a different organization. I know here at Mirazan, we tried a few years ago as well, right. about plus two or three years ago. Right. And then recently, we brought it back in-house, hit or miss. So I know we have it. I log into it every once in a while, but not as, not as often as some of our other engineers. Right. Right. So the deal with Yammer is like, okay, so you're in Microsoft Outlook, and let's say that uh, somebody, Brenner Olds, one of our engineers here, mm -hmm. specializes in storage. He posts something in Yammer about storage. Well, if I don't have Yammer running, I've got to go look to see, did Brent post anything on storage today? Well, with Enterprise Social, they're going to bring that Yammer content to your inbox. Right? So you don't have to go look for it. They're going to bring it to you. They're going to bring it to you in a way that's intelligent so that you don't have to sort through all of it. You can sort through the posts that you care about. That's really great. Yeah. So within Yammer, of course, as you know, with anything, you can create a group. Uh, so if we had a group called Virtualization Specialist, or another group called Exchange Specialist, or another group called Link Specialist, 
you can subscribe to those groups. They have that content delivered directly to your inbox. That's great. So this is a, a screenshot of what that might look like. You know, you can have your social conversations going on at the same time. Um, here is a like a sales activity social dashboard. You know, you, you have people who are in a sales group that you subscribe to. You can see that dashboard right there. Again, without having to leave the Microsoft Outlook device. So you're really trying to deliver content intelligently to you so that you don't lose credit. Yeah, so for example, here at Mirzon, this is three separate apps, right? We have Outlook, we yeah. have Yammer, and mm -hmm. we have ConnectWatch, where we keep track of our customer relationships. Right. So that would be great to have that in one pane of glass, wouldn't exactly. it? Exactly, one pane of glass. <laughs> and that's the thing is that they're trying to present a one pane of glass experience, not just across your laptop, but across your tablet, your phone. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that in just a minute as well. So really cool announcement. What I, what I did see is that they're delivering most of these new things to Office 365 first. And then they're going to bring it to on premise, and so that's kind of a trend we're seeing a lot. Right. Um, somebody even asked Perry, who is the god of all things Exchange, they said, "Okay, Perry, tell us the truth. This is on stage at the keynote. Is Exchange on premise going away?" And Perry gave his response that kind of said yes and kind of said no. So it was, it was interesting. Wow, kind of vague. <laughs> Pretty vague. I mean, and of course the keynote speakers, uh, the product manager was like, "Okay, Exchange on premise is not going away." She she, she made a more pointed statement. Everybody still had question marks right. over their heads, you know. Um, another thing about enterprise social, and I just talked about this already with respect to groups, you know, across applications, whether it be Link, whether it be Yammer, if you have a group that you subscribe to, uh, you can see the information right there in your inbox. It's going to be seamless and pretty impressive. Um, going to move on to some of these and talk about code name clutter. That's an awesome name. <laughs> I like it. What's clutter? All right, so. <laughs> Typical day, you pull up your inbox, right? And what do you have? You've got, I don't know about you, but I've got a thousand messages just sitting in my inbox that are waiting for me to take some kind of action on them. You know? And of those thousand, maybe a hundred of those are unread, right? So you come in, you sit down, you look at your inbox, you go, okay, wow, what am I going to do with that, right? What am I going to act on first, okay? So um, clutter is intelligence designed to figure out mail that you're likely going to read and mail that you're likely not going to read. It also is going to learn how you respond to messages. It's going to be watching you as, as you delete things, as you respond to things, as you categorize things as junk. It's going to be learning your behaviors. So what's cool about that is that when I get my inbox with this new clutter feature that they're going to I set up, let's say that I get a message from you and I go, oh, that's their old delete. Okay. <laughs> not that you would do that, of course. Of course not. Yeah, right? of course not. Or I get another message from them and I go, yeah, I want to get to that later. And I put it over my bureau window. Right? And I do that a dozen times. Clutter is going to figure out that I don't necessarily care about looking at messages from you right now. Right. Maybe later. Right. So let's say I'm collaborating with Craig Stein, one of the Marathon partners here on a project, and I respond to every single message I get from Craig that day. Craig goes, okay, he thinks messages from, I mean, Clutter says he thinks messages from Craig are pretty important. So let's bubble those to the top of his inbox. Right. Let's make that visible right now. And anything that comes from Duro, we're going to stick over his Clutter view. We're not going to even deliver that to his inbox. Not only are we going to not deliver that to his inbox, but we're not going to even pop up a notification. Mm. So I don't get distracted by messages from Daryl. Right. <laughs> right. I can see pop-ups that come from Craig immediately. So they've done some research. And if you think about your day, particularly if you're an information worker, what happens? You're working on a project, working on a customer server, and you get a pop-up. Message from Daryl. Message from Kevin. I got to make a decision. Okay, I'm going to open that email right now. Right. Uh, am I, okay, and if I do open it, well, am I going to act on it right now? Am I going to file it later? So you're distracted dozens, if not hundreds of times every day by little pop-ups, right? Clutter is going to minimize those pop-ups by only notifying you if you receive a message that you actually care about. And it's going to know the messages you care about because it's, it's watching how you read your email. Very, very intelligent. Uh, very, it's, it's amazing the design of it. Not out yet. Again, right. This is coming. Right. Okay? And guess where it's going to come first? Uh, Office 365. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but it, it's interesting because, you know, junk mail, you know, you get a folder, you get all your junk mail there. Yeah. Right? That I forget about. That you forget about. <laughs> and so, and, and, and there, there's some mail that you actually care about, but you don't care about it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, so I subscribe to CNET. I read that article. I read the newsletter from CNET every single day. Right? But I don't read it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I read it at 6 o'clock at night when I care about it. Right. <laughs> when I actually have time to look at it. So, um, it's going to figure out that I don't care about it until that time. It's going to start bubbling that thing up to me at the appropriate time. So it's really, really impressive. Yeah, that intelligence sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, 
So the user experience principles around clutter is that you know you're gonna have a triage because that triage is what's that what's important. Right. Um, again, as I've already said, clutter is not gonna interrupt the user via notifications. Uh, it's gonna allow you to train the system, you know, based on your preferences. The one thing I did ask because they had a, a Q and A session after the clutter demo. I said, well, what what if I don't want my users to ever treat an email from the CEO as clutter? Right? Can I? Can I set up a transport rule to, yeah. or something? And the answer was no, <laughs> right? Wow. So uh, at least that the answer is no today. Right. So I think they're going to have to build on some type of intelligence to make sure that maybe you never treat certain messages as clutter because <laughs> if the CEO sends out a message, we're shutting down business, you might want to know that. Right. <laughs> or know? things like severe weather alerts, right? Exactly. You know, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So but the answer was there's no logic built into that just yet. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All WA for mobile. All right, so if you think about email that you get, uh, most of the time people see email, 50% of the time they see email on their mobile device before they see it on their laptop or their tablet or their desktop. 50% of the time. Okay? Yeah, me too. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because typically, maybe if you're, if you're an engineer, you're not in front of your desktop. Mm -hmm. You're out in the field, you're driving, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're in a meeting like you're doing right now. You know, but, but for the record, Karen, we would not ever look at our phone while driving. Exactly. Yeah. Never. <laughs> exactly. Never text and drive, never email and drive, right? So, uh, but, you know, with, with Outlook, if you're looking at email on your phone, you get, there's feature gaps there. There's things that you can't do on your mobile device that you can do on your desktop, yeah. you know? So, if, you know, there's, there's a lack of continuity there. You know, there's things that you can do in Outlook Web Access that you can't do on uh, your Outlook client, there's things that you can do on the phone that you can't, I mean, it's just, there's all this disjointed feature set. Microsoft's trying to fix that, okay? Um, they're trying to make sure that you get one experience across all your devices, whether it be. So if you pull up Outlook Web Access for your laptop, it's gonna look the same way on your tablet as it is your phone. That's, that's what nice. they're trying to get to. Okay? Um, you know, and then the thing, you got different devices that they're trying to support, and I thought this was interesting. From the stage, they actually said, during the keynote, they said, they have figured out that 80% of the mobile devices that are touching and are changing are iOS. Mm. Right? They actually said that from the stage. I'm surprised they would say that from the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so at the keynote even. So um, so what Microsoft is realizing, they've got to make things work for the devices that they're making now, for what they're making now, on those phone patterns. Um, so, and I talked about this briefly, but you know, there's 20 billion messages sent and received every Whew. single day. Wow. Right. Of those, again, nearly over 50% of them are being seen on the mobile device first. So can you do everything you want to do on your mobile device today? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, yeah. <laughs> announcing for the third time <laughs> Outlook Web App for Android. Now, have you used Outlook Web App on your iPhone? I have, yeah. Okay. I've used it for um, my Office 365 account, okay. but I've also used it for our Exchange 2013 account. I know that's not a supported methodology, mm -hmm. but when I had some customers using it, I wanted to play with it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Now, compared to the built-in email messaging client on your iOS, how, how is it different from that? What, which, which, what features are different? Sure. So, I, I'm an iPhone user, so I use just the built-in mail app for connecting to Exchange. Okay. And I could set it to like you know show messages for a certain number of days or weeks or whatever. IOS, or sorry, the OWA app for iOS, I'm trying to type in my code now, <laughs> um, by default showed me everything. And that's what was at first it was a little disorienting because I had some old emails in my Outlook client on my PC, but I was still part of my inbox. When I went to iOS mail, I didn't see the old emails because they were after that particular filter of time. Okay. But I bring up OWA on my iOS and everything's there again. So it was a little disorienting for me at first, switching between mail and OWA. Okay. I had to remember what those filters looked like. Um, I like the view of it because it reminds me a lot of Link 2013. Right. So they're trying to unify that, that look and that feel, right? So mm -hmm. it looks like OWA 2013 inside you know, Internet Explorer. It looks like Link 2013. I, I like that a lot. I like the fact that it pops up a lot more notifications to me natively and quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I know that sounds silly, but inside iOS, I use the mail app, I use calendar, I use those kind of things. But I've just found it to be a little bit more uh, feature rich. Gotcha. Yeah. gotcha. So with that, you know, you, you talk about your calendar. People, they may not about our calendar. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> the thing is, like, I use, I have an Android. I have Touch that app, which is like mm -hmm. my, my messaging client. 
And within that, you know, if I want to set up a meeting with you, uh, I can't see if you're busy or not within the touchdown window. That's going to change with the Outlook web app. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make that. These, these are the features they're going to make available within OWA or Android or uh, iOS, you know, whatever your flavor is. You're going to be able to look at pre busy schedule. You're going to be able to, be able to schedule online meetings. You're going to be able to view proposed times. These are things you can't do today with the uh, native messaging apps or third party apps, but you will be able to build those with OWA. That's what's coming in. Right. So one thing real quick that I really liked about OWA for iOS, I'm sure it's going to be that same way for Android. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a mm -hmm. link user. I'm a link admin. Um, I'm very much a link advocate. Mm -hmm. So in the link client on the PC, also the link client for mobile, when you bring up your calendar view, you can do one-click join of right. meetings. Right. I can do one-click join to link meetings for the OWA app from iOS. Right. And you bring up your calendar invite, there's a button down to the details that says join meeting online. Exactly. I like that integration built into OWA. Right. I don't have to bring up the link client. It's now I have one app. Exactly. Which is what the beauty of Link is itself. Now I have this OWA app that has all that feature set. That's, that's, that's really great. It's impressive. Yeah. And so again, single pane of glass. Right. Same experience across our devices. That's what we're really trying to get to. Um, I think it's nice that you know if you if you have a meeting invite, you know, within that invite, I can click the address, get driving directions using the map directly within the invite. Right. So, uh, so all these leads us to a pretty good place. Yeah. Yeah. So Durand spends a lot of his time in Exchange. I spend a lot of my time in Link. And so it was interesting. We were talking the other day as we were kind of preparing for this webinar about how Link and Exchange play together. Um, we like to use the phrase, or I use the phrase often, that Link and Exchange are married. And they really are. Yeah. Um, so I know at the Link conference, there was quite a bit of talk about Link and Exchange, whether Exchange is online through Office 365 or Exchange is on-prem. There were, there were many conversations in breakout sessions, but then just like walk at the floor. Was it similar to that at the Met conference? Was there a lot of exchange and link conversation? There was. And I mean, you, you could literally, as you walk through the showroom, you know, you know where the vendors are, you could see people sitting on couches having conversations about, and then actually have whiteboards. I thought about you because you're a big whiteboard. <laughs> I am a whiteboard guy. <laughs> right. And so they actually have whiteboard, uh, whiteboards set up all outside of the vendors. And so if you wanted to architect the solution right there you know, for link and exchange, you could do that and get input from the vendors that were right there. Right. That's very neat. That's really great. So uh, much of, of my role um, is design and sales. So I, I do field engineering, um, specifically focused around some networking things and link. But much of my role nowadays has, has shifted in the last year or so in sales and design. And I have the link conversation many times every single week. Right. And people like to ask the question, how do the two coexist? How do I make link and exchange talk? Do I need to have it on prem? Do I need to have it online? That conversation can sometimes get kind of muddy, and it almost makes it sound, sound overcomplicated. It's not, but it's not also super simple. You kind of have to understand the ecosystem. Sure. Kind of like with Exchange, Link is the same way. There's more to it than just email. There's more to it than just instant messaging. You have to know directory services. You have to understand DNS. You have to understand certificates for both of the products. So. People that work on Link and people that work on Exchange and the two conferences, they just naturally go together. They really do. And Office 365 has added some new wrinkles to that. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great product. I love Office 365. I'm a large advocate for it. I know that Durand is as well. Uh, but I thought it would be good to talk a little bit about on-premise versus Office 365 and what goes where. So from the Link perspective, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Link on-premise can do all modalities of what Microsoft calls the various ways to use Link. So instant messaging, presence, conferencing, dialing conferencing, screen sharing, enterprise voice, persistent chat, all of those things are fully baked into the Link on-premise product. Okay. Link online can do all of that, much of that, but the big thing that's different is voice. Link online does not do voice. By voice, I don't mean like clicking a button and having a two-person audio conversation via IP over the internet. I'm talking about actual like real dial tone voice, whether it's an analog line or a PRI or a SIP trunk. So real voice, like enterprise level voice, dialing in, dialing out, using cell phones. Link online does not do that today. There are some hosting providers that offer that. And that's why I kind of mentioned before, 
in the keynote, that one random vague bullet point that talked about it's coming to link online. What does that mean? And I, and I can't answer that question. But for today, for these purposes, link on-premise, enterprise voice, link online, not enterprise voice. So the next logical question is, well, what about voicemail and this true unified communication and auto attendance and all those brilliant things that you can do when link and exchange truly are married? Right. All of that can be done whether exchange is online or exchange is um, on-premise. Right. Uh, there are some small caveats with things like some messaging APIs and playing messages on phone. There's some small caveats, but not nearly as large as the caveat of no link voice with link online. Right. So I don't know for sure how many times Duran has had this conversation. I know more than once. So I have Exchange on-premise, but I don't want to manage Exchange anymore. I want Exchange to go to Office 365. Is that going to prevent me from doing anything in the future? It's a great question. So from the link perspective, no. Take that Exchange server, take it from on-premise to move it online. If you ever wanted to integrate enterprise voice, man, you're fully covered. From your perspective, from the mail flow and, and transport, are there any real differences between Exchange on-prem and Exchange online? That, that's the beauty of it is that I can, I can mix and match. I can do it all in the cloud. I can do it all on-premise. It just doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, the functionality is going to be the same regardless of where I am. Yeah. You know? And uh, Microsoft is really trying to make the uh, experience as seamless as possible. I, do th I think it was interesting because we were talking about Office 365 and, and how Link marries into that very well. Um, I deployed this recently for an educational institution, and they go to sign in the OWA, and they go, well, what's, what's that green dot next to my name? What is that? And I said, mm -hmm. well, that, that's Link telling you, telling Preston Roll that you're available right now. You're not busy. You don't have any appointments on your calendar. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even know we did that. Right? Mm -hmm. It was just so easy to, to put the two together. Right. Uh, but no, the, the answer is it, it doesn't really matter where you put it. It's going to work the same. Right. As far as exchange is concerned. So the conversation is a lot simpler when you're talking about just exchange. Right. You know? um, but again, I keep coming back to the fact that they're going to be delivering features to Office 365 first before they deliver them to on premise. And there's some instances where it may not ever get to on premise. So I'm kind of curious to see how that plays out with respect to that trend. Uh, the functionality is the same. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and it, I don't want to say that it's, that it's like exact opposite, but in some ways it's kind of opposite. Um, Office 365, things are coming to there first before they come on premise. I think of that from the Exchange perspective, definitely from mail and OWA and what that um, user experience looks like. Mm -hmm. But we still have this nagging question about voice. So voice is on-prem, but it's not online. So does that mean when they eventually do bring it to Office 365, are they going to start deprecating or neglecting enterprise voice on-prem? I don't think the answer is yes. The answer is not yes. But I'm just interested to see how they finally, um, or how they how they separate if they do separate the Exchange product on Office 365 versus the Link product when they bring new feature sets to Office 365 right. before on prem. That's going to be a really interesting conversation to watch yeah. over the next little while. Hmm. Um, so one of the questions people ask a lot is, is how to make the two work together, Link and Exchange. How to make the two work together. So in a fully on premise environment. Um, Link and Exchange talk to each other via certificates. It's mutual TLS. It's 100% secure. So there are some PowerShell scripts that you run on Exchange. There's an executable you run on Link. And that's what kind of marries the two together. Right? It's, it's, it's not complicated at all. It really isn't. When you take Exchange online from on-prem, you don't have to do that all at once. So Exchange in Office 365, Exchange Online, they have a great hybrid product. So you can move users back and forth. It's, it's fine. The wrinkle comes in with unified messaging right. because of mailbox policies and, and unified messaging policies. So if you have policies named Bob on-prem, you can't have the same policy online called Bob. Right. It'd be called Bob2 or Fred or Bob Online or something like that. So when you move a user from on-prem to online, through that moving process, you identify what those policies and things look like on-prem versus what they look like online. That way, the, the users move successfully. And to make unified messaging work properly for Exchange Online, a part of that comes into play with the Link Edge server. That's kind of how the two communicate. Exchange Online communicates via Link Edge. So it's not really hard to get there. Um, there's many ways to make that happen. Um, there's products like session border controllers that you can use with Link On-Prem. Um, a key difference that's interesting, from the Exchange perspective, whether I'm on 
Office 365 or on-prem. Is there really any difference by emailing users or receiving emails or global address lists? Is there any difference that you can think of? You know, it's, what I found was interesting, because I was thinking about this scenario that's described, I had an educational institution uh, where they had two or 3,000 student mailboxes they want to post, and they had two or 300 faculty mailboxes they want to post. Well, students didn't need this. All they needed was email messaging, for instance. Uh, faculty had to have unified messaging. They had to have somebody to answer the phone, dial attendance, and so on. Mm -hmm. So what they did was what you just described was a hybrid solution, where they have 80% of their users in the cloud and another 20% on-premise based on unified messaging management. So that's a perfect example of why hybrid makes sense for them mm -hmm. and how the two play together. As far as messaging, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, mm -hmm. so if I send a message to you, whether you're on-premise or you're in the cloud, the only thing is that there's an Office 365 connector that gets set up and routes it out because it realizes that, okay, he's in the cloud, he's not on premise. That's all done intelligent in the background. The end user doesn't experience any difference at all. It's, it's, it's different for Link. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So <laughs> Link users belong to pools, and pools belong to front end servers. And so the pool where your users exist on prem is different than the pool where your users exist online. So there's things like policies and, and feature sets for um, joining conferences, and there's, there's, there's caveats. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. You just have to kind of be able to educate yourself as a, as a technologist, but then make sure that our customers and, and Link users are educated on what that looks like. Right. But again, like I said, there's many ways to get from here to there. So I think that kind of leads us towards the end. Um, so as, as the experience that we have in Exchange and the experience we have in Link, um, we've done it. Uh, we've done the heavy lifting for you. We, we go to conferences, we learn these things. Not just to kind of be say, hey, we know this product, but man, we're able to architect some really creative and some really interesting solutions for, for you. So thanks for email or, or link or other things as well, but kind of our goal, um, you see it in the bullet point and it's, it's not just words. Our goal is to find the right solution for your budget, for your go growth, for your specific need. Right. And that's why Duran's here, that's why I'm here. That's why we have a whole team of Microsoft trained and certified engineers that know lots of product lines. So as we need a little help um, or train others, um, just know that we have a full team backing us uh, no matter what the product is. That's, that's what Mirazon does. Again, my name is Daryl. Uh, I'm the guy on the left, Daryl.Hunter <laughs> at Mirazon.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at Daryl Hunter. Um, I do some active blogging here at Mirazon, Mirazon.com slash blog, <laughs> Duran. So yeah, Duran Bryant, you can reach me at Duran.Bryant at Mirazon.com. Um, and so definitely excited about this going forward. One thing I do want to mention that, that uh, we kind of glossed over is the thing about budgets. Oh, yeah. Is, is we will design to your budget. We don't present a solution just because we can, right. just because it works, or just because it's slick and it's an excellent thing. We are, we are budget minded and we are architect based on your budget, what your needs are. And uh, so we, we have businesses who are nonprofit who want to go to Office 365. We have businesses who are hospitals and they have 5,000 people and they're enterprise and they have lots of money, right? right? No matter where you are in that space on, on the budget field, we can architect based on your uh, constraints or needs. That's true. All right, so thanks for joining us. It's been good talking with you. We look forward to talking to you again.